Exodus 39. In two weeks we will start Romans as we seek to understand God's, as we seek to understand the gospel. Today's sermon I've titled, Set Apart for God's Service. Now some traditions and denominations and religions have, even in our modern context, garments, vestments that are set aside, set apart for religious use. We as Baptists don't do that. Why do we not do that? Why do, why do we not enter into worship with all these adornments as other religions and traditions and denominations do? Because we recognize that when we read about these garments, these vestments in Exodus, that there's a distinction from the Old Testament to the New. The vestments that the priest wore and that the high priest wore were not something that were to be carried on in per 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 perpetuity, but they were for their time and in their place to be used to point forward to the Christ. Today we're going to look at the making of those priestly garments, the making of the ephod, the making of the breastplate, the making of other priestly garments, and the work completed. Verse 1, Exodus 39. And of the blue and purple and scarlet, they made clothes of service to do service in the holy place, and made the holy garments for Aaron. As the Lord commanded Moses. Lord Jesus, we bow before you. We thank you. We thank you that this is not some cold, abstract text. With dust covering the pages. Marking their irrelevance for your people today. But indeed... This text is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide between soul and spirit. Lord, we pray that you would instruct us this morning, that you would shape us this morning, that you would call us into closer fellowship with you and with one another through your word. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Aaron's high priestly garments point to the person of Christ. Indeed, as we've seen with regard to the tabernacle and the furnishings, indeed, as we've seen as with regard to everything in this book of Exodus, it's pointing forward to the Christ. And these garments are no different. These were called holy because they were set apart for God's service. There wasn't anything special about them other than the fact that they were commanded by God to be set apart for God's service. So in other words, somebody could make a replica of those garments. Would that replica then be holy? No. No. That garment that, that high priest Aaron wore and the subsequent high priest down through the years until the time of Christ all pointed to Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God, were set apart for that purpose. The ephod, verses 2 through 7. And he made the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet, and fine twine linen. And they did beat the gold in, into thin plates, and cut it into wires, to work it in the blue, and in the purple, and in the scarlet, and in the fine linen, with cunning work. They made shoulder pieces for it, 
to couple it together. By the two edges was it coupled together. And the curious girdle of his ephod that was upon it was the same according to the work thereof. Gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine fine linen, as the Lord commanded Moses. And they wrought onyx stones, enclosed in pouches of gold, graven as signets are graven, with the names of the children of Israel. And he put it on the shoulders of the ether, that they should be stones for memorial to the children of Israel, as the Lord commanded Moses. So why is it that Moses describes this as curious? That word curious is a reference to the unusual way in which the ephod was woven. It was not woven in such a way so that it would be identical, so that it would be something that the common person would wear, but rather it was woven in such a way to set this man, the high priest, apart. There again, pointing from that human high priest to Jesus, our great high priest. Jesus, in the incarnation, yes, he came as a man. He wrapped himself in flesh. He was born to a woman. He was raised in a home. He experienced every temptation as you and me experience it. But he was also set apart. He was set apart for service. He was set apart for God's service. There were four articles that were similar to those of all the priests. So all the priests had certain garments that the high priest wore alongside the other priests. But there were four articles that were peculiar to the high priest. Think about what that's pointing to. Jesus said, Peter, or not Jesus, Peter, but it was given to him by Jesus, so it wasn't entirely wrong. Peter said, ye are a chosen priesthood. So we, as the people of God, are a chosen priesthood, but we still have the one great high priest who is Jesus. Jesus is separate and distinct from us. So the high priest wore four garments that were common to all the priests, and then he had four peculiar, particular articles that were for he only. These were garments for glory and for beauty and picture Jesus in all his grace. When the high priest wore those garments, it set him apart. You knew who that high priest was because he was adorned in beauty, he was adorned in honor, and it gave the people of that time a visible representation of Jesus' grace. Now remember, the commandments say, Thou shalt not make any graven image between heaven above and the earth beneath or below the earth. This is not a prohibition. This is a commandment by God. So, so you and me have no justification for using our imaginations to fashion something for the sake of worship. God Himself gave visible representations to the people in that time so that they would have a picture of that which was to come. And that's what these adornments, garments of glory and beauty were for, a picture of that which was to come. On the Day of Atonement, Aaron would lay aside those garments of beauty and glory. So 364 days a year, perhaps 365 if it was a leap year, they didn't 
acknowledge that back then. 364 days a year, the high priest wore these four additional garments of glory and beauty. But on the one day, on the pinnacle of the Jewish calendar, he took off those four peculiar garments. And he wore only that which was common to the entire priesthood when he went into the Holy of Holies. He wore only those simple linens of the other priests. He was unadorned, but pure. Now, isn't that a picture of the Lord Jesus? You and me see pictures now that, that try to represent Jesus. The pictures we see make Him pleasing to the eye. But what did the prophet say? He had no form that we would look upon Him. Jesus was not this figure in His, in his humanity that captured attentions by His appearance. Jesus would have looked no different. In fact, if Jesus were to wrap Himself in flesh today, you would not be able, by appearance, to separate Him from the crowd. It would be the ultimate, where's Waldo? Jesus, when He came to this earth, in the Incarnation, he was unadorned. Otherwise, why would the Jews say, you're the carpenter's son? Why would the Jews say, we know your brothers and sisters? We know your mom. We know that you're from Nazareth. Why would the Jews be so intent on Jesus' plainness and His commonality if Jesus had an appearance that would attract folks to Him in appearance only. The application here, God does not use a simple preacher, teacher, or layman regardless of how prominent or talented. Now before you read into that, and say, well, all of us are sinful, all of us are wretched. The, the idea here is God doesn't use someone who is engrossed in practicing habitual sin. Yes, we all sin, but what is your life characterized by? Falling into sin and wallowing in sin are two different things. You can sin without wallowing in the mud like a pig. Just because, and I'm going to pick on Eric since he's not here. Just because Eric's walking out of the yard and he stumbles over a tree root and falls in this great big mud puddle doesn't, does not make Eric a pig. But a pig, when that pig finds that, that big mud hole, will wallow in it because that pig lacks something that Eric has. Sweat glands. Pigs have to wallow in that mud to keep themselves cool. Eric has sweat glands. He doesn't need the mud to keep himself cool. So God does not use a sinful preacher, teacher, or layman, regardless of how prominent or talented. We've all seen stories going back into the, in the 80s of prominent preachers who fell from grace. Some of whom disappeared. 
altogether, some of whom, whom make an appearance, a reappearance, and, and claim that those sins are under the blood. That grace is sufficient. Yet grace is sufficient. But there are consequences for sin. And, and the one who reaches that quote unquote pinnacle of success and falls, I don't believe the Lord's going to restore him back to that place. Will there be a place of service for that man? Yeah. God can use who He wants, when He wants, where He wants. But that place of service does not mean back here. The man who's gifted, or should I say talented, with delivering a good sermon and lands in that bigger, better church to later fall, he can still serve, but there are other ways of serving. In fact, I would suggest that that man then becomes one of the saints because ministry is not the pastorate. There's a difference between the pastorate and the ministry. God gave first apostles, then prophets, then evangelists, Pastor teachers, why? For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. The ministry is what's done by the body, by the local church. The equipping is what's done by the elders and pastors. God does not accept the works of that man who presumes a restoration. God considers the works of that man to be what Paul said in Corinthians. Wood, hay, and stubble. The servant of God must be clothed with righteousness. Think about how the Lord Jesus came. He, la he laid aside His prerogatives of God. He laid aside the Shekinah glory. He even laid aside some of the things He knew. What did Jesus say? No man knoweth the day or the hour, not even the Son of Man. When Jesus was walking this earth, wrapped in flesh, He didn't even know when He would return. He said what? Only the Father knows when He would return. So when Jesus came in the Incarnation, He laid aside His own prerogatives of God. He laid aside that Shekinah glory. If He hadn't laid aside the Shekinah glory, then the, then the Jews would have recognized Him right off. He came to earth as a man, offered Himself he offered Himself as the sacrifice for sin. He died in His humanity. Back in the 60s and 70s, what, what were they going around saying? What, indeed, what did John Lennon once boastfully claim? God is dead. Now, 40 plus years later, John Lennon is dead and God is alive. God never died. Jesus in his humanity died. That's the mystery, if you will, of that hypostatic union. Jesus was fully God and fully man. He died in his humanity. In his deity, he offered that death as the pardon and punishment for our sin. Second Corinthians chapter five. Second 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh. And now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. With that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now when we are in, now that we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin. He made him to be sin for you who knew no sin. That we might be, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What's the power of the cross? What's the power of the crucifixion? The one who knew no sin was made sin. So that the one who knows sin is made the righteousness of God. God imputed Christ's righteousness into you and into me. Turn with me also to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 23. And they truly were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost, to come unto God by him. Seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So these holy vestments, these holy garments worn by the priest, and those specific to the high priest, were discontinued at the cross because those priests, that priesthood, that high priestly office was limited by the lives of the men who served in those positions because they could only serve until their deaths. But Jesus But Jesus suffered death and gained for you and me an unchangeable priesthood. We no longer need those garments to anticipate a priest, a high priest to come, but we have a great high priest after the order of Melchizedek. The making of the breastplate, verse 18. 21. And he made the breastplate of cunning work like the work of ephod, of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twine linen. It was four square. They made the breastplate double. A span was the length thereof, and a span the breadth thereof, being double. And they set it in four rows of, of stones. The first row was of sardius. A topaz and a carbuncle. This was the first row. Second row, an emerald, a sapphire, a diamond. Third row, a fig, a ligand, and a gate, an amethyst. And the fourth row, a barrel, an onyx, and a jasper. They were enclosed in ouches of gold and their enclosings. And the stones were according to the names of the children of Israel, twelve according to their names, like the ravings of the signet. Every one with his name according to the twelve tribes. And they made upon the breastplate chains at the ends of wreath work of pure gold. And they made two ouches of gold and two gold rings. Put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. And they were and they put the two wreath chains of gold in the two
two rings on the ends of the breastplate. The two ends of the two wreath chains, they fastened the two ouches and put them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod before it. And they made two rings of gold and put them on the two ends of the breastplate upon the border of it, which was on the side of the ephod inward. And they made two other gold rings and put them on the two sides of the ephod underneath, toward the forepart of it, over against the other cup of thereof, but the curious girdle of the ephod. And they did bind the breastplate by his rings upon the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue, that it might be above the curious girdle of the ephod, and that the breastplate might not be loosed from the ephod, as the Lord commanded Moses. These twelve beautiful stones show that Christ carries you on his heart. What an assurance that is, that Christ carries you. This ephod... We're not sure exactly what it looked like, but they had those 12 stones for the 12 tribes because the high priest would have the 12 tribes upon his heart just like the Lord Jesus has you on his heart. John chapter 3. John chapter 3 will begin with that Famous and famously misconstrued verse. Beginning with verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that His will believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17. For God sent not a Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is in the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. And everyone that doeth evil hated the light. Now they're coming to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Arminians love John 3.16. God so loved the world. And if that's where Jesus stopped, if that's where the gospel writer stopped, then our many of would be true. General atonement would be true. But, Jesus didn't stop there. The gospel writer didn't stop there. And neither should you and me. What does it say? He that believeth on him is not condemned, but the one who believeth not is condemned already. It's not that the one who, who doesn't believe is waiting to be condemned to the fires of hell. He's condemned already. And what's the condemnation? Light has come to the world. Men love darkness. What are we seeing when we turn on the TV? Men love darkness. What are we hearing when we turn on the radio? Men love darkness. What are we seeing when we View the internet. Men love darkness. What do we see in social media? Men love darkness rather than light. What do we see in all these menus? Their deeds are evil. What do we see and what do we hear when a faithful gospel preacher, whether that's an ordained pastor or a lay preacher, preaching sharing the message of the gospel. He's called a hater. He's called hateful. Why? Because men hate the gospel because they hate the light. The light. Then we see the making of other priestly garments. Verses 22 through 31. And he made the robe of the ephod of woven work, all of blue. 
and there was a hole in the midst of the road, as the hole of a harbin, with a band round about the hole, that it should not rend. And they made upon the hems of the road pomegranates of blue and purple and scarlet and twine linen. And they made bells of pure gold and put the bells between the pomegranates upon the hem of the road round about between the pomegranates. A bell of pomegranate, a bell of pomegranate, round about the hem of the road to minister in, as the Lord commanded Moses. And they made coats of the linen of woven work for Aaron and for his sons, and a mitre of fine linen. And goodly bonnets of fine linen, and linen breeches for the fine twine linen, and the girdle of fine twine linen, and blue and purple and scarlet of needlework, as the Lord commanded Moses. And they made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold, and wrote upon it writing, like the engravings of the signet, holiness to the Lord. And they tied unto it a lace of blue, to cast it on high upon the mitre as the Lord commanded Moses. The robe was adorned with golden bells and pomegranates. Now I've already shared the purpose of those bells. One purpose of those bells was so that when the priest went in to the Holy of Holies and he was all alone and could not be seen because of the bell that separated the Holy of Holies from the Holy Place, at least the people could be as long as he was moving about, the bells would ring. But if the ringing stopped, they knew something was wrong. And the high priest can't survive the Holy Holies. How much less the priestly order. Pomegranates display a fruitful life of the believer. The fruitful life of a believer. What is that fruitful life? Love, joy, peace, patience, long suffering. On and on. It's the fruit of the Spirit. What does the fruit of the Spirit look like? That looks like speaking the gospel to the culture around you, both in word and in deed. These folks who say, well, I don't share the gospel verbally, but I, I, I live a Christian life. There's a Greek word for that. Baloney. <laughs> I can't remember, Charlotte, maybe you, you or Nadia can remember, one of the Catholic folks in history made the erroneous claim Preach the gospel always, and if you have to, use words. I can't remember which, which of the Catholics said that. I've heard that before, but I can't remember. But that's baloney. Because how do you call a sinner to repentance if you don't use words? Yes, our actions need to back up and verify our words, but if we only lead a godly life and we never communicate verbally then we can in no way, shape, or form call sinners to repentance. We must speak the truth in love. And in love includes sharing of the judgment that is to come. It includes sharing of the consequences of sin. Bells could the testimony that light. The bells could be heard by the priest outside. And they knew that the worship of God was taking place. They knew that intercession was being made for them and for the people. Worship should draw you and me to the person of Christ who represents you and me in the presence of the Lord. What's the reason we get? We don't just gather because this is a convenient time and a convenient place. We gather to be drawn to the person of Christ. Why? Because Christ 
represents you and me in the presence of God. What's Christ doing up there? Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father because His blood's already been applied to the mercy seat and to the Ark of the Covenant. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father because His work is done. It is finished. The engraving is in the signet with the words holiness to the Lord. Holiness to the Lord. We don't understand holiness in our day. And in part, it's been because folks within our tradition have developed holier than thou attitudes. In part, it's been because of uh, the holiness movement, which was led by the Wesleyans, the Pentecostals, and the Charismatics, that presented holiness as something other than that which the Scriptures present holiness. Holiness to the Lord. That is rec recognizing who we are. And what we are. Recognizing the evil of our deeds. Recognizing His mercy and His grace. <clears throat> then 32 through 43. Thus was all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation finished. The children of Israel did according to all the Lord commanded Moses. So did they. And they brought the tabernacle unto Moses, the tent, and all the furniture, his hatches, his boards, his bars, and his pillars, and his sockets, and the covering of ram skins dyed red, and the covering of badger skins, and the bell was covered, the ark of the testimony and the staves thereof, and the mercy seat, the table, and all the vessels thereof, and the showbread. The pure candlestick with the lamps thereof, even with the lamps be set in order, and all the vessels thereof, and the oil for life. And the golden altar, and the anointing oil, and the sweet incense, and hanging for the tabernacle door. The brazen altar, and his gate, and his great of brass, his staves, and all his vessels, the labor, and his foot, the hangings of the court, his pillars, and his sockets, and the hanging for the court gate, his cords, and his pins, and all the vessels of the service of the tabernacle, the tent of the congregation, the clothing, the clothes of the service, the service in the holy place, and the holy garments for Aaron's priest, and his son's garments, to minister in the priest's office, according to all the Lord commanded Moses. So the children of Israel made all the work, and Moses did look upon all the work. And behold, they had done it as the Lord commanded. Even so had they done it. And Moses blessed them. The work was completed. And notice it wasn't the work of one man. Notice that the entire congregation of Israel was involved in presenting this work. Whether it was the tent, or the furnishings, or the holy place, or the holy holies, or the priest garments. The entire congregation brought the gifts, hammered out the metals, wove the fabrics, made this place of worship. It was not the work of one man. Men should have time to prepare messages by spending time before God. But in our day, most churches have solo pastors. And those solo pastors have a whole list of things among their responsibilities. A list of good things. A list of things that are known. But in Acts chapter 6, when the congregation grew, 
And it was stretching the apostles beyond limit. What did the apostles say to the congregation? It is not good for us to leave the Word of God in prayer to wait tables. They didn't say it wasn't good to wait tables. But it wasn't good to place waiting of tables as a priority over and above prayer and the ministry of the Word. That's why our bylaws state that the preaching element has two responsibilities. The preaching of the Word and prayer. There are many good socializing, backslapping, holding hands, being a nursemaid, and everything under the sun that a lot of churches in our day assign to the pastor. But all of those things could be summed up in the last clause of what Paul said to the Ephesians when he shared about the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, how their job is the equipping of the saints. And what's the work of ministry? Socializing, backslapping, and holding hand, hold hands, being nursemaid, and everything, fan of the sun. Whose responsibility is all that stuff? The saints for the work of ministry. What's the work of ministry? It's all those good things. All, all those noble things. There's nothing wrong with any of those things. But it's the work of ministry, which is for the saints, the body, the membership, not the pastor teacher. All those good things that a pastor may do but those must not distract from his meditation and prayer. The elders. And, and, and the, the truth is, sovereign grace has a distinction that in years to come will set us apart. Set apart for God's service. But also give us an advantage in this community. A church that's able to pay a full time solo pastor. That man is limited by the sheer nature of only having so many hours in a day and hence so many hours in a week to do all of this stuff plus minister the word of prayer. A church that cannot fund a full-time pastor that calls a bivocational pastor and hence a bivocational solo pastor, that man's time is further strained because of now having to do all of this stuff and having a full-time job and having to do prayer and ministerial work having a plurality of elders like we have, even if the three of us are by vocation, we can still accomplish as three what no other church in the area can accomplish with one by vocation pastor and probably not even with one full-time pastor. Because we've now multiplied the number of hours in a day by three. These garments pointing to the person of Christ. And it pointed to the person of Christ. They were, they were done away with in the work of Christ. Because now you and me have a great high priest who sits in heaven. Now the work is done. And he intercedes for you in your hour of need. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we bow before you.
We thank you for your goodness, for your grace, for your glory. Lord, shape us and mold us. And that which you've called us to be. In your name we pray. Amen.